Hey, this is Huck. Subscribe to Thorin's YouTube channel. Right, this is going to be another episode of Reflections, and this one is going to be with Huck, who was a long time StarCraft II pro, and then more, well, not even that recently, but that's just how long the, the, the interview is going to be covering time span. It feels like more recently, transitioned to becoming a general manager in the Overwatch League of the Boston Uprising franchise. So we'll talk about some of that later. Obviously, we're going to start with the StarCraft II angle, which is, what was your actual... Um, background before starcraft 2 because i noticed whenever i went out there in the early starcraft 2 days and i looked in mm. everyone else's background almost everyone else was like some sort of a pro like they're rather like a brood war pro which is the most tenuous thing of all time in the west because like it basically just meant you went to a world cyber games qualifier and finished top four or something you know like it wasn't exactly like the, the same as some of the other spots and then the other thing was or they were a warcraft 3 player either like a famous war or in the case of people like stefano they were sort of like uh, trying to be an up and comer and they hadn't made it yet but i noticed for you as far as i could tell were you just like playing semi-pro or something it didn't seem like you had a proper background yeah so in in, in starcraft one i i don't like it's where you draw the line i guess on pro so i got paid to play but it was mostly um as a smurf um or playing like on team canada or team usa b teams okay. so i had a few matches like uh idra like i beat idra a couple times and like I don't know, back then, like the Team USA versus Team Canada was like a big matchup. So I right. beat him and a match was probably the most noticeable thing I did. But it wasn't, um, you know, it didn't make headlines. I wasn't like a super known player, but I like reached, uh, geez, what was it? Like A minus 1v1 on IC Cup. And then like, that's pretty legit. That's like yeah, you get Korean pros about, at that level. Yeah. Yeah. But it was more like. I made a minus and then I never touched that account again, you know, kind right. of thing. Like okay. I barely made it. And then it was, okay. and I like played a lot of two V two. So I played a lot of two V two with this guy called, um, I believe his ID was by Spire, uh, which is like a popular team back then. So like, uh, cats and a few other people were really into two V two, like Drew B was. Um, so I, I played that I played company of heroes. I played like, you know, going back like Dune command and conquer. Like I was a big RTS guy, right. uh, but I wasn't super well known. So yeah, like when I came into Starcraft two, I was kind of like the new kid on the block, even though I grew up playing RTS games, I just wasn't super well known and didn't really have the same accolades as some of the other guys. Just to touch on that, because if people don't know, again, right, the, the interesting thing to me is this, right, the analogy I'll give goes at this. You know, in a lot of, like, traditional martial arts, right, especially the ones that, like, karate, that unfortunately they let little kids do. Well, obviously, you can go to any gym right now in any city in the world and meet a little kid who goes, I am a black belt. It's like, mate, I could take yeah. you outside right now and thrash <laughs> you. What that means is you did a bunch of fancy dances for your teacher and he get in exchange sure. for $200, he gave your dad this black belt. Whereas famously, if you know the sport Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you yep. literally can only become a black belt in that sport by beating black belts eventually you have to, mm. it's like it's like the ultimate skin in the game basically i would give this analogy actually if i was being rude about like the brood war players who you know were just going to the world side games here's the difference if they told me hawk that they were like a plus in fucking ic cup then i'd have to go whoa whoa okay Okay, I can't fuck with that because if people don't know, it is incredible. I mean, you can still play an IC Cup now. It's incredibly difficult to get through the ranks on that. Like, you basically have yep. to be very good. And as soon as you hit, like, an ed not not even that high up, you will be playing, like, people who have got insane hours in Korea. And like I say, once you get to a decent enough level, you will actually just straight up be playing Korean pros, people in the team houses. No, probably unlikely at that level you actually play like the top top pros you'll still play people on real teams though especially because the KD to a lot of fans won't know is actually the ping wasn't that bad especially from North America it was doable to play Koreans in Starcraft you know it wasn't like something like Counter-Strike or something where it would be unbearable on the ping so like that must mean you put in a decent amount even if you didn't really play once you got there it was kind of just for status you must have put in mad hours in Starcraft 1 yeah yeah I, I, I mean I played for years off and on um, but like once I had the opportunity to be like a semi pro, like I was getting paid, I don't know what it was like, maybe 300 bucks a month or something. I like, you know, wasn't working a summer job doing that instead. But I, yeah, I mean, I played a lot, um, played a lot of middle school, high school, um, grinded the game. It was super fun. And it, it was different back then because you didn't, um, the, you know, the scene obviously wasn't as established, but there was also just like less know-how of like, what's a pro, what does it look like? Um, so like I went through the natural progression of like, I don't know, starting at that karate 
kid level where you're playing like money maps, use map settings, and then eventually right. you like discover like Lost Temple, and then you kind of like progress and you learn more, and it's like really exciting to climb that ladder and like slowly but surely like, realize the scene where like these days, right, everyone knows esports, you know, through whatever game, Fortnite or uh, Dota League, whatever. So, yeah, it was it was an experience to say the least. When you actually moved over and StarCraft 2 came out, like, were you one of the people who, did you really hop on it, like, right in the beta? Because I noticed there were some people, you know, sort of, like, held off, like, is it going to be any good? Obviously, people had see, seen some of the things that were going to come up, like the multiple building selection. I know some people who were hardcore were, like, quite against it. Were you were you quick to embrace it? Uh, yes, yes and no. So, like, I wasn't super well known. So, like, when I started playing the, the beta, I was sharing an account with, like, four or five other people um so i could only play the account when they weren't playing so i was getting on at like you know 3 a.m playing until 7 a.m 8 a.m and then we kind of have like a back and forth channel where we discuss who and i was last priority so i would like raise that account to diamond which was the highest rank at the time and then they would like bring it down and then eventually you know playing enough i eventually got like i joined a team to get my own beta account uh my own key um and i wasn't all in like i um when I first started, I was actually, I went to the U.S. and I applied to, um, I was I was doing the ASVAP test to join the U.S. military because I was kind of at like a crossroads. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Like I was financially good. I was playing poker on the side, doing all right. Um, but I like needed direction. I didn't want to take out loans to go to school. Um, you know, I didn't come from like a wealthy background or anything like that. So that was kind of like a waiter move. So I, I, I went to the U.S., took the test, talked to recruiters, things like that. I was going to join the Marines. They had like a, I don't know, like a two, three month wait period. And that's when the beta came out. So then the beta comes out. I start playing it. I'm like, oh, I'm pretty good. Um, and then like I get my first offer eventually. And then I was like, okay, let's see how this goes. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll wait on the military. And, you know, if this goes well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll re-decide. So, you know, very close to having a very different life um, path, you know, uh, in a very short amount of time. But like, I, I don't know, it like came out, I tried it, had fun, kept playing, and then just like slowly progressed. It was definitely not like, a, I'm all in here, or this is going to be my profession or anything like that. If people ever remember that documentary, I think it was a Canadian television documentary, the one they made that came out like a couple of years after mm. the year when you had the MLG success and you joined Evil Geniuses. It yep. was around this time period in that story, it was sort of alluded to that like, look, I'm not going to go far into this because again, I think actually private life and career are two separate things. But it was alluded to in the backstory of that, something along the lines of like, you know, maybe in my personal life, I was sort of, get, I'd gotten into trouble. Or I was in sort of like a slightly rocky aspect. When you say this part here, like you would think of joining the Marines. That's a pretty extreme move you know that's that if i had to look like again just only if i didn't know anything about you aside from that documentary it sounds like that was almost like you were just looking for something in life to commit to like like i'm gonna just pick something i've got to just pick something go down this avenue yeah i yeah so like when i did the asvap test i um did really well so they said like you can pretty much like any branch will take you happily you can you know have some discretion on your uh mos job and uh everything else um, so I did well, but like, yeah, like I wanted to join the Marines. I wanted to see combat. I kind of had, I don't know, like chip on my shoulder, wanted to prove something attitude, um, which is, you know, very different to what I am now. But yeah, like my past was a little uh, rocky to say the least. Um, so I definitely had that, you know, uh, scrappy mentality and, you know, uh, wanting to do something, not really sure what. Uh, and I mean, I help. I, th I think that helped me in my career too, right? Um, you know, obviously, in some ways, it was detrimental as well. But it, sure. it gives you kind of that edge to like push yourself. You have something. You know, you're you're going to be really driven with that kind of perspective. So. I mean, the obvious thing without skipping ahead too far is to me, I always thought one thing that was actually, I think you never got full credit for is people get that like Nanawa went to Korea again and again and again, and a couple of other people did. Some of them that didn't actually have as much success as you guys, but mainly the others, like, let's be real. They would go for like a two months and after one month, they were like, fuck this. I'm, I'm leaving. Like, I don't want to have a 40% win rate and then just losing the GSL cough. So like, I always wondered about that. You never actually really got credit for actually being a hard worker. Like if you were in Korea all that time, you must've been grinding. Like, do you think? This, some of this comes from this you were you were i mean like i say if you put it so we can get into the marines if people don't know it's very hard like the majority of people will feel it like even some of the physical tests famously are incredibly mm -hmm. hard so you must have had a very dedicated mindset in starcraft to some degree even though that sounds like you know you took the easy path out yeah definitely i i mean like 
my career ups and downs. Um, but at the beginning, uh, you know, the first year and a half, two years I was in Korea, it was literally that my my perspective was like very, very similar to a military style. Right. And the setup for Korean houses back then were very militaristic in a sense, like you have a small room and then you have just bunk beds lined up back to back to back to back. Um, you know, you got like six to eight guys sleeping in one pretty small room, sharing a bathroom. Then you have like a room with PCs and yeah, like everything, like I went to the gym and stuff. Um, but it was literally like, I want to be healthier so that I'm better at Starcraft and you're playing Starcraft all day when you're hanging out, you know, like I would go on walks with uh, Jinro and Hey Pro or whomever was there at the time. And we'd be talking about Starcraft. So it was, you know, very much at that early point in my career, my trajectory and where that, you know, rise came from was that like, I'm, you know, I'm doing this or I'm not doing anything, you know, I'm all in, I will do whatever it takes to be successful. Um, and I think, you know, obviously that, that, that helped me a lot. If we rewind a little bit to the beginning of StarCraft 2, right? If I just say openly, I'll, I'll let you do my job in this sense. If I just say you won one of the first MLGs, that sounds fucking epic, dude. Everyone remembers MLGs. Like that. It wasn't mm-hmm. like Boxer and a bunch of sick career. Give me the context, though. Like, let's be real. Like, this obviously was like one of the weakest that they did. Like, in the beginning, it was very cheap, right? There wasn't that much money. What, how would you describe, like, what was it at the time in your little bubble? What was the significance of winning that tournament? Um, I think like, you know, not being an established player and then becoming that established player was probably the metric at the beginning. Uh, all the MLGs really didn't have great prize monies, to be honest, True. Uh, to be true, even though the, the uh, later one that I won. But yeah, like the first one I won, it was, you know, almost completely Westerners. But there were like the Idris, Kiwi Kakis, sure. you know, EG guys, Liquid guys. Um, so like when I won that first MLG, I was still like the player that did well in like online cups but hadn't done anything at land and there's always kind of that test even to this day right like are you gonna prove it when it matters at land um but when i first won that first land it was like okay this kid's for real like you know he showed up he did well he did well on land he beat you know good players so he's you know now accepted as like a legit i don't know like established pro whatever you want to call it so uh definitely like some respect um but you know there's still like that huge you know Korean side of it where we're unsure at that period of time. Right. Obviously, after this, I mean, normally I wouldn't go through all the results because so many, but the next MLG, the one you didn't win, I want to just ask you because, again, unless someone's around, the story's too old. Give me the story of this match where you did the mothership rush, but then you also tried to like mind game. I think it was Select, right? You tried to like yeah. mind game him that it, the crowd wasn't cheering that you were doing a mental uh, mothership, yeah. which obviously isn't a real strategy like at the pro level. Give me the backstory on this. Yeah, did you always get away with it for real? I did. I could have won the match. Like sometimes, I don't know, like once every two or three years, someone will link it to me or something. I'll watch it and I think, like, man, I could have won this match, which would have made it, you know, that that much more. Epic. Sure. Um, but yeah, like I, I was always a player that was like very freestyle. Like literally, heat of the moment, I'm going into the game. Like I'll be like, you know what? I'm gonna try this. I've never practiced it, never done it before. I'm gonna try it. Um, and this was one of those matches. And um. So yeah, like, you know, the game's progressing, um, you know, pretty normal openings, Scrap Station, which is like a pretty divided map, and I'm going Mothership. And at this point in um, StarCraft Two, when you build the mothersh- Mothership and it completes and it comes out of the Nexus, there is like some very noticeable lag that occurs in game that only happens when this unit yes. comes out right and then also like soundproofing is not great at mlgs at this point right and there's a yes. lot of stages there's you know at this period it's like starcraft's on the up and up halo's probably the top game but starcraft's catching up so like our stage is right next to their stage so we hear their cheers they hear our cheers it all happens so mothership comes out noticeable lag and people in the crowd are like screaming and like it's exciting and you know whatever else because no one ever does this strategy sure um so then i type you know something like you know don't worry that's halo because i'm referring to the stage (laughs) next door people are cheering for halo not what i'm doing here um so it's like you know you know one of the one of the games i'm definitely remembered for really cool i wish i won i think i could have won uh but back then you know uh Mistakes were easy to come by, um, you know, for the level of play and everything else that came with it. 
Along those lines, again, without skipping too far forwards, obviously people will know later in your career you tried a lot of other crazy shit. You had moments where, like, it seems like one aspect that's interesting is I've actually found that a lot of Westerners stupidly looked at the success of Korean players who were the absolute best and thought, right, I'm going to make myself like a Korean, like, essentially. Mm -hmm. And if people don't know, Koreans essentially, as as a general trend, love standard play. They Mm -hmm. just love the idea of, like, a formulaic approach, the systems-based, like, analysis. And the idea is you just try to refine that to be the best possible version and you always do the correct player so if he opens A you go B and then he goes C and then mm-hmm. you've got like there's a logic to it you know but I noticed in your style like as you say you were very freestyle uh, I think also in, like in a game like this I, I, that's not the best strategy half of that's also like the entertainment value right you must have known like this part of this is for the crowd almost right yeah I, I, I caught a lot of flack um, I mean, you're, you're right on all those points. I caught a lot of flack early on um, before I was a, an established pro where I said, like, it, I don't know, people were very pretentious. I, I said something in, like, a Team Liquid interview where it got posted on Team Liquid, which, you know, was most of the StarCraft scene at this at the time. And I said, like, I want to be like Boxer. Like, Boxer is, like, my idol, someone I look up to. I want to play like him. It wasn't, like, I want to be as good as him or I'm going to be as good as him. It was kind of, like, I want to be like that, and people got really upset. But, like, yeah, like, I not only wanted to win and do well and be a competitive player, but I also wanted to do it in, like, interesting cool ways and i think when you look at you know uh, korea versus the west especially back then you know they they grew up in these team house environments practice partners watching replays all of that um so it makes sense that their style is more you know strategic uh nailed down you know detail wise everything else for me it's like i only play ladder right so like i'm not doing that much review i don't really have anyone else to talk to i'm not in a team house i don't have a coach so i'm literally just all over the place but i i think it worked you know i think if i could go back in time uh i i could be a better player if i did some of those things and did you know could 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 do both sides of that coin right and i think even like looking at a player like flash that's what he's really good at is like he is a beast absolute monster at doing a very standard macro game but then as well he's like one of the best players at cheesing and because he has those two tools those two extremes in his arsenal it's really hard to play against him because you know if, if you over prepare for the macro game you're going to lose to the cheese and vice versa um so i think i could have been a better player if you know uh i had learned more and took more in but at the same time it, you know it worked for me and from like a career perspective of popularity um signing to teams things like that it it, it helped as well right because i was one of the you know more well-known players because of those crazy strategies and plays wasn't there a story like a later time, like the next year or whatever, when you were at an MLG? I'm pretty sure it was against Boxer, right? There was some like delay or something. And weren't you trying to get him to actually play you in Brood War or something crazy like that? Or was it like there was a show match or something? Do you remember this story? What was going on? That sounds like, it, like I just not try to do it if I could. Yeah, we. I mean, we had a good relationship um, from the get go. The first BlizzCon that I went to and the Koreans went to, he was there and he had a GSL match coming up and we both got knocked out of BlizzCon pretty early, but he asked me like his, his opponent was Protoss. I was one of the only Protoss players there. So he asked me to be his practice partner. So like for two or three days when we we're at BlizzCon, like I practiced with them nonstop, like try to talk to him about the builds through a translator, things like that. Um, and then when IPL came, you know, we were still like pretty friendly and the internet went down. Uh, for for all of IPL and someone in the crowd like basically just yelled out you know we should play Starcraft one Huck should play boxer and then like people cheered or you know whatever happened I don't remember exactly but something like that and they had uh, Starcraft one on like uh, a little disc so um, they popped that up we like you were like sure we can do it we're you know very friendly I was friendly with his wife Jessica um, and we played a match and we went we went one one. Uh, which is cool because like to me it's not (laughs) if i lost i would be disappointed if i won i'd be really excited but one one is like a respectable thing i think we literally just played two games because the internet came back up and then you know the tournament uh proceeded but yeah definitely one of the like cooler moments in in my career right i don't feel like a lot of pros get that opportunity to play you know someone like him and it was cool of him to accept too because if you're being like cutthroat businessman about it it's like you're not going to gain much. No, you of beat, course not. You right? should never say yes to that. You yeah. can only lose, right? You you lose <laughs> yes. even one game. You lose the whole match. It looks horrible. So um, it was it was really nice. Um, 
and it was fun too, right? And I think people, you know, that were there really enjoyed it as too. It was kind of like that uh, Neo's fighting Morpheus moment or whatever in the Matrix was a common okay. comment. So it was, it was, it was pretty cool. One thing I also noticed very early on in your career is, and I'll say this, right? I remember you actually told me something like, ah, oh, like when I, when I did an interview with you, I did an interview with you at Assembly, the event in Finland at the beginning mm. of like 2010, mm-hmm. right? And then I did another interview with you, I don't know, like a year later or something. And you told me, but you, I think you were actually wrong on this. I think I went and checked it. You were like, no, oh, you're the fucking guy I said top three control to. Like, mm-hmm. I actually got in a bit of trouble for that, mate, but okay, I guess we'll do another one. But I actually, I'd listen, I'd love to take credit, but I'm pretty sure I actually went back and watched that interview. I think you said it in some other interview. But I will say, the reason I bring this up right is obviously that comment to some degree haunted you for a while because for a start off like you're not the best korean player so already everyone already is like we can't possibly have amazing control even though by the way i, I think you wouldn't anyway had control as good as koreans at times i've seen I've, I've watched enough games to have the eye tests you know but what i was leading into is this even early in your career one thing i think you understood was almost like the media game like you understood when you do an interview i've got to give one guy like a little bit of juice here but i've got to give another guy i can't say the same things in every interview and sometimes i've got to build my brand right the reason i bring this up is a lot of pro gamers listen a lot especially like a lot of starcraft games it's not a social game it's a 1v1 sure. game there's a lot of people don't have those skills in fact someone like idra by the way was totally primed to be the biggest doing this dude he would get mega butt hurt in interviews of people saying like, oh, he would like he actually didn't get that side at all he really wanted it to be very strict and straightforward did, do you think you saw did you actually consciously understand this was it some sort of intuitive feel because it seemed like you talked to it very easily the interview side um, no, it, I, I think it just came naturally to me. I don't think it was as much a like conscious choice like, oh, this will be good for business and this will be uh, good for my brand or anything like that. I, it was 100%. And once I started seeing that traction, it definitely, you know, didn't hurt. But I just had fun. Like that, that's me having fun, right? When I played sports, it was the same thing. Like I would banter and talk trash when I play video games with friends growing up. Same thing. I'm just generally that type of person who likes to banter and have fun so it came very naturally um and i i think i had more more room and more confidence because other people were also not doing it right so then you just feel like no one's doing this why like why not it's fun to me like i want other people to do it so i tried to like just try to have fun and see and i think some pros were like you know they they would say stuff back and it would be mild but like the you know more popular incidents were obviously when people did not take it as banter and of you know, more offensive yeah and i mean like the top three control thing um i was absolutely slammed during that interview to be honest but it was basically like i felt i was really good at that time um but i was not showing the results like that finland assembly tournament aces i i bombed out i had bombed out of gsl tri- tryouts uh qualifications like once or twice so it was like i felt i was good i felt like i didn't get the results I was smashed. I was talking trash. But like also like in line, like, you know, I'm willing to like come out and say something like that. And to me, I'll I'll deal with the repercussions, but I think I'm good enough that I'll eventually approve it. So it's like kind of whatever. When you went to Korea, as you allude to there, you went through what basically everyone did, which is you go there, you think, oh, I'm pretty good in the West. You know, like, yeah, they, I, I've put a few Koreans at tournaments. So, yeah, they're good. But, you know, like, I, give me a chance. And I've basically found, I mean, I, I talk about this a lot in my interview I did with Nanawa because he was one of the people who sort of really opened my eyes to this. He told me, like, you almost you almost have to have, like, a masochist mentality. you got to go there and know they are going to actually just body me for, like, maybe two months. And, in mm-hmm. fact, even if I'm in a team house, like, you know, from the outside, all those idiots on Team Liquid thought, like, oh, they're all friends friends in the team house with the westerners they they give them everything it's like dude the coach might tell the guy to give you a practice but he might be begrudging if he doesn't think you're good enough he'll just begrudgingly give you that practice he might not even try in it and also by the way you're unless you have a really great relationship you're definitely not going up to the superstar player on the korean team and going oh can you practice me 1v1 now on the maps i want in that you know like remember the way those the hierarchy in their house is everyone gives all the resources to the star player. They practice his matchup and while his maps, he's going to play against the next guy. You know, people don't realize it's not as simple like an exchange of information. So when you went there, what was the initial like exposure like? Like, is it shocking to go and fail a qualifier for GSL and be there for, wait, I've got to wait another month and to be in these team houses and find out what the reality is like? Yeah, I, I mean, I would ne- I had never been outside of North America before. I'd never been to a big city. I'd never seen a skyscraper. Like all of this stuff was so new to me. Um, I remember to this day, I, I, I flew into Korea. It was rainy and just driving from the airport to the team house, seeing all the neon lights, just like s- a simple thing like that was like mind blowing to me. And then you get to the team house, um, 
hearing hearing the keyboards like i'm really tired i just flew you know whatever it was 16 hours or something when you're in a team house and you hear like eight to ten people practicing clicking their keyboard in starcraft it sounds kind of like rain which is was really soothing to me and like all of these memories i don't think i'll i'll ever forget um as far as the hierarchy yeah like initially you gotta you gotta kind of prove yourself um there's definitely like a mentality of respect and if you're not up to par uh, even like you said, we we had like uh, when I initially got there, like an internal practice system where everybody had to play each other a certain amount of games, and then there's like an internal team ranking, and then that's how they pick who plays in GSTL or whatever. Um, you know, if if you're on the lower end of that, people are just gonna like cheese you, right? And it's not about winning or losing. It's like I just want to get this over with because it's not going to be beneficial to me. And then yeah, if um, you're a good player, you have an important match coming up, whether the coach dictates it or it's just kind of like understood culturally within the team, um, you're going to have practice partners. And the practice is not like a unilateral, uh, beneficial, mutually beneficial thing. It's, you know, one-sided in the sense that one of those players, you know, if you're the star player, you're going to get someone to practice and you're going to say like, hey, this is what I want you to do. This is the build I think he's yes. going to come out with. I need you to run this. And I need you to run it like 10, 15 times. And then, okay, next game, I want you to do this iteration. Or, you know, they might open up and say like, okay, like every five games, I want you to throw in, to, throw in some kind of cheese or whatever. But you're literally the practice dummy in that situation. Yes. So it doesn't matter if you play that map. It doesn't matter if, you know, you want to practice your own build and that's not your style. You're kind of, you know, doing that for for that player and it goes both ways right like once you do gain that respect once you are an established pro once you have even um just that personal relationship with your teammates you are going to have that same length and then it becomes mutual right like i'm going to practice with you you're going to practice with me like you know we can ask each other um to help but i think compared to nanawa i had a way easier time in korea than him um, and it's partly to do with the Team Liquid OGS partnership, but it's also right. like I was there for a long time. I actually like was pretty close with those a lot of guys. A lot of those guys still sure. consider them close friends. So I had probably a lot of the benefits that maybe he didn't have. Yes, I mean I'm sure also the social aspect helps. Like listen, I'm sure he realizes himself he didn't do himself any favors. He did basically alienate, alienate yeah. all the Koreans and then think the ones in my team house will be okay. It's like you know think I went through. What I wanted to ask was this, and I'm asking it very carefully because he made a very bold accusation in his video, which he he genuinely believes before he played famously MVP in GSL, he believes that basically won't say who again it's up to him to make the accusation he basically believes like some players who actually were in his practice circle in the team house just leaked like builds or what he was practicing or how he played you know because he literally felt like he got like hard counted or something did you ever get any sense that anything like this was going on was there anything like this ever entered your consciousness while you were there entered my consciousness yes um so like i for him I, I don't know right i don't know the mvp guys nearly as well as i knew the ogs guys i think it's to i think it's totally plausible that it could have happened i think so for me me personally i am not and maybe to deal with you know my upbringing and everything else i'm not a very trusting person especially back then so i did not practice a lot with other people there was like one or two matches that i can remember that i did um because i didn't trust people and it's like i didn't trust anyone um and i also just wanted i literally just played ranked all the time that's that's how i practice um there are other players like i know jinro for example was you know very trusting and like practice and had practice partners and like he was very uh methodical with how he did his builds um for me i and i i don't think there's any i think looking back i definitely could have trusted those ogs guys more and probably would have been a better player but like for multiple reasons for whatever reason i just didn't you know, I, I didn't like playing with other people. And I always kind of like thought, like, oh, what happened? If they leak this, I'm just screwed, right? Yes. Like, there's no chance if if it gets leaked somehow. And, or I could just play ladder, and I feel like I'm pretty good, and I can get more or less same practice. So I was just kind of like, I'll just do the safer option to me. Um, I think misstep by me. But for Nanawa, I think he, I think it's totally possible considering um you know, what happened for him in Korea in comparison. Because <laughs> they also hated him, yeah. Like, I, I always told yeah. him that didn't help. That didn't. That certainly didn't help the question. But what about this? As I alluded to earlier, there are tons of, like, Western champions of MLGs, DreamHacks, all IEMs who went over to Korea. Some of them even thought, by the way, yeah, I'm going to stay a month. If it goes well, maybe I'll stay three months. And who knows? You know, they all went home after two months or after one month. Or they just tried one time in, in GSL Core Day qualifier, got dusted off by someone they've never heard of and just fucking packed up and went back 
back to wherever, Sweden. It could be any country. You know, basically the story happened many times. When you went there, what this initial block, where, as you said, in terms of results, you were basically in a slump. Even in the Western competitions, you weren't actually winning the ones that on paper you were supposed to. As you say, basically the core system, it took you a while to get to that, just to get in there. And then once you're in there, to get out of a bloody group, it takes a few times. There's clearly like a sort of a competitive ladder you have to go up. Were there ever moments in, in this, like, it, right when they're in the midst of that, where you're not getting the results, you're practicing tons and tons. You know, you're doing your absolute best. Do you ever, do you ever think oh, maybe I shouldn't stay in Korea? Maybe I should just go back to the Western Circuit, or maybe I'm not going to make it. Do you ever question yourself? Uh, no. Heart heartbreaking. One hundred percent heartbreaking. Extremely frustrating. Like close to punching someone, throwing things, whatever. Um, but I, you know, I didn't have anything else in life. So to me, it was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it as hard as I can. I feel like I can do it. And even if I keep failing, I'm going to do it until I can't do it anymore. And then we'll see what happens next. But I guess like when you don't have other options, um, you, you're all in no matter what you choose. Right. And I, I think that even to some degrees highlights the difference in uh, Korea being successful to this day in esports. Right. They have military service hanging over their head they have True. a hyper competitive society you got to make it into like top one or two universities maybe the third and if you don't make it into those universities your life's pretty screwed you're not gonna yes. be able to get a, even a decent job and they have all these factors piled up on their head and it's like if you want to be a pro you, you better make it because if you don't make it you you fucked up your life right in the west it's you know you don't make it you you, okay, I'll go to Korea for a few months. If it doesn't work out, I can go home. I'll live with my parents. I could always go to university. I could always yes. go to school. I'll take a couple years off. And then they, you know, you're you're enjoying it. You're playing. Some players play harder than others, but there's definitely like these safety nets that um, make you not all in. For me, it was like I'm all in. Like if I go back, I'm joining the military, uh, probably, or you know, something else that um, probably is less promising and less fun than uh, pro gaming. So it was like this is it. Like I'm all in this is what I'm doing and I, I, I'm going to make it. So, One thing I think a lot of Western fans always overlooked is that even the qualifiers for these, because you're in Seoul, it's all on LAN. You go to an actual physical building, you go in there, you play it, but there's a million of you at the beginning, obviously, and they're all, they're all randoms. You're trying to get through the core day qualifier. By the way, that isn't as fucking easy as a Western will think, because nope. it's not about the form in a tournament in you know Germany if you're on a weekend. Right? I've heard so many stories of players where they're like, dude, you don't get it. Like Before I went there, like for real, on the ladder, I was like, you know, I was doing really well. In Western terms, I really was one of the best. Like, it's, I wasn't in any way in a slot because but when you go into that room, it's like, holy fuck. Like, you just realize I'm here, shit. That really is like a Korean player. Like, I've heard that it's just getting over that aspect is like, there's almost like a stage fight element. Was there anything like that for you? Was it difficult? Yeah, I mean, different setup too, right? Like, you're practicing at home or at a team house or whatever your situation, and then you got to move your keyboard and mouse. And if you're not used to doing that, um, a lot of those things will impact you as time goes on. Obviously you get that experience and you kind of learn like, Oh, I got to remember, you know, like there are famous players like flash who like have the ruler and they're measuring right, yeah. everything, but there's, there's tons of factors like that. Um, I, I don't feel like usually I got too nervous. Um, I just, for whatever reason, you know, early on, I just didn't make the, I actually feel like I was good enough. Um, bad matches. I don't know, bad setup whatever it was i just I, I just wasn't cutting it but there's definitely like that that pressure where you're like okay this is real now right and there's like all those players and then like you got to know too like you know to your previous point there are a lot of players um who who are like sh sharing ideas sharing builds or like oh yeah he just beat me this is what he did or yes whatever and you're not gonna have those connections right we we had a lot of support and there was definitely that um supportive layer from the OGS guys. Like we had a manager and a coach who were very friendly. Our teammates were really friendly. You come by, you know, give your shoulder massage. Like you can do it. Um, I, I think it'd be a very, very different and more anxious experience. If you're showing up as like a random Westerner, you don't have those people, you don't have a translator, you don't have someone that's going to hold you, your hand through those things. Um, so I think I had it easy and still, you know, there it was, it was, it was tough, you know, at the beginning for me. 
thing is, the one thing I, I, I how I actually understood why Nanawa said he could get through it is because he told me the best moment ever was when you grind for two or three months in Korea and they're just kicking your ass. But you, you're getting gradually better if you sort of, like, if you take the bigger picture, like, obviously you have to do this in poker as well. You can't look at, like, each day. You've got to just look, like, over two weeks, I did get better against that build and I did start mm-hmm. to get the. He said the best moment, though, is when you do fly to the Western tournament and then it's like you just get to unleash on everyone. So when you came back and you won this DreamHack summer, that must have been a big moment, right? After all these fucking months going and going hard as hard and hard yeah because i was i still i think it was literally if i remember i failed a gsl qualifier and then team lick was like they weren't planning i wasn't planning to go to the dream act because of the gsl and then they're like do you want to i think they kind of felt bad i think victor kind of felt bad and he was like, okay. want to come to this instead and i was like okay yeah like sure might as well and it was like literally the next day a flight or something um and i flew and yeah like uh up to that point you know, I had won those Western MLGs. I went to Korea. I had like a decent amount of hype. Like we think this guy could actually make it in Korea. And there was still this, this mindset dating back from Brood War of like Westerners will never compete with Koreans. It just won't yes. happen. There's there are two different levels. It's not. It's going to be the same thing in StarCraft too. So those early days of like mixed events, like Westerners are still going to GSL. Some of them have some success. Like Jinro, uh, a good friend of mine, still like had you know, some success, but it was not the same level. So then when we go to DreamHack and there's a decent amount of Koreans, it's like, you know, it. we expect a Korean to always win. Um, and then obviously doing, you know, doing well, winning that event was uh, really, really, really exciting, really cool. Um, I think even right after that, there was the Home Story Cup. I, I don't even think I was like invited or going to that. But then after DreamHack, I, you know, um, obviously went to that and won that too. Humble brag. <laughs> Fair enough. And then it, it was only at that point in time, you got the, like, the, the big result finally. And then when you went back to Korea, it was only like, what, like a month, month and a half before you actually did the Code S run where you got to the top eight. Now, I will say there's two things I've got to ask on this. One, and by the way, one thing that's weird as an underlying topic is, as much as there was loads of fans, like everyone got super hyped every time a Westerner was in Code S or GSL even just qualified, you know. I have to say at the same time, people forget how many fucking haters there were. There were so many people who just pulled for people like you, Nana White. It's almost like they wanted you to fail and be destroyed destroyed by the faces Korean that would, you know, just showed that Westerns get like there was a, people almost built their identity into that shit sometimes. I always thought people would just be riding with you on that. So when you came back, did you did you get a feeling some people wanted you to fail in this endeavor? Well yeah, I I mean I'm thinking I think at this point more about the other pros who probably have that mentality. But yeah, there was definitely a I mean the support to me always outweighed the you know the haters. Right. Um but but there were there were quite a few haters who were like kind of a lot, a lot of times it was like the old school brood war elitists who are like, sure. oh, well, you know, this, they can't do it. They, they're not going to be able to do it. I mean, to, to the haters credits, you know, there, there was never, um, you know, especially early on like that, that huge success. Like I get, I made top eight, w- w- which was really impressive. Um, I also went to, I think I made a poor choice in that run. I went to, so I had that dream hack. I had the home story cup. Then I went to an MLG, like, and I landed like the day before, um, the GSL match against like MVP, which is just <laughs> sure uh, soft throwing. It was the best player I'm in the world, basically, yeah, right? <laughs> just soft throwing and not preparing at all, right? I'm practicing okay. at MLG playing matches, so it's not the. But um, I, you know, I, I think you know if we replay that match a bunch of times, I think uh, MVP still comes out ahead. So. Okay, but on that angle, though, like, what's the story of that? Like, why? I mean, listen, was this, like, obligations that you had to attend the MLG? Did you really just think it won't matter? Like, if I'm good, I'm good? Why can't, a lot of people would think that's, like, the chance of a lifetime. You know, like, as you say, he's, like, the best player in the world. I think it was just, so it was my choice, and it was literally, like, I just want to play. Like, to me, I would love to go and compete versus practice, and I can practice while I'm competing. And that, like, it's still that same, like, freestyle bantery, let's have fine mindset. Like, I want to work hard, and I'm going to play the game nonstop every minute that I wakingly can, and let the chips fall where they may. Um, and like I said, now, older, looking back, um, definitely could have been more methodical and smarter about how I practice. But at that time, that's my perspective. I just, I want to go compete. I want to play matches. I want to, whatever, whatever I can do, I want to do. Um, so I'm going to play all the qualifiers, all the tournaments, literally everything I can touch, I'm going to do. 
I, obviously, I've actually got the timeline a little bit off here, but I'm not trying to make it like all chronological. It was just before this that you'd also joined Evil Geniuses, which was like a big blockbuster move at the time. Right, there's two angles I wanted to ask about with this. One is obviously they played up like a motherfucker because it's great marketing. The whole like yep. Idra and Huck have finally like joined together or whatever, you know, and everyone knows the history you'd had with the whole like hallucinated army. And like, as you said earlier, look, it, it, let's be real. If you were anyone except like three Westerners, you're just not allowed to be Idra. Otherwise, he, you are his mortal enemy. Whether you're his mortal enemy or not, he will mm-hmm. continue as much. That's just, he's, he's had a very intense personality, right? On that angle itself, how much of that was just marketing or just things on stage? Like, was he actually real, real? Realistically, was he actually like an enemy before he knew you were joining AG? Have they tried to even play up the angle of like, oh, like he, I had to ask his permission before we could recruit Hawk or some shit like that? Was that was any of that real? So that like asking Idra, I don't know. It's totally possible knowing um, Alex Garfield and Idra's dynamic. I'm 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 I I honestly don't know. It's it's possibly true because Idra was still, I think, at that time a bigger draw, uh, bigger star. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, streaming numbers, other things that are important to an organization. So I think it's it's plausible. Um, on you know him disliking slash hating me, I think if you asked any pro from that era, there's two there's two Greg Fields, right? There's the end game Idra, who is just a complete asshole, uh, who could sure. be sitting, you could be living with him, and he's ten feet from you. And he's going to say some very derogative things if he loses to you, especially if he le- loses into a, to you in a way that he wish he didn't, like in cheese or whatever, right? Sure. Um, and then there's, you know, Greg Fields that you're hanging out with, going to the movies or dinner with, and he's like pretty chill, nice, you know, after parties, whatever it is, he's totally fine. Um, I do think he had a little bit more of an edge to me than some other pros. I mean, we're both kind of like the North American top pro players, right? There is that extra layer of like, this is the guy that is actually competing for my number one spot. Um, But I still think like to this day, back then, whatever, if we're hanging out after an event at an after party or we're at the EG house and we're going to get dinner, there's no issues. Now there are the, you know, there's quite a few stories about like, um, you know, having, having a rough time, uh, you know, when, when matches are tight or, you know, whatever it is, but I think that I think every pro would say some some version of that, like in game, out of game, two different people. I think you even had some hilarious angle you did in like an interview. I think it was like a hot bit interview where you just made it that you sounded like, you know, I've got this new guy in my life, you know, he's a bit intense. You, know, you had a pretty good angle on it. It seemed like you, by the way, it seemed also like, to be fair, compared to a lot of other pros, you also seemed like you sort of knew how to approach him and how to sort of win him over. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, I think even to this day, like if I meet someone, um, in a, in a friend circle who's like super introverted, um, but they're nice, but it, you know, they need a little push to help come out of their shell. Like I'll, I'll joke with them a little bit more and um, try to try to help them with that. Right. And Greg was the same thing. Like I tried to make him, you know, feel comfortable, have a good time, you know, when he's having a tough time, be a little bit more sensitive. Um, obviously there's a lot of people who are like, Oh, he seems a little aggravated. I'm going to intentionally sure. push his buttons a little oh, bit course. more. There's that too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think like, you know, if I messaged him today or whatever and said, what's up, man, uh, we'd, we'd be totally fine. So how would you explain to someone in knew him and even played against him? How would you explain his competitive mindset? Because I feel like, unfortunately, as you say, there was such a strong, distinct on camera personality that people just he's one of the most divisive figures ever. Because people either loved him and sort of rocked with it, almost yep. sometimes on a villain tip, or they just despised him. And I know famously, for example, like even a lot of the things critics would say, actually, if they knew the context, that's not even a diss. Like, you know, the most famous one, right, is when he was in Brood War, they used to go, You were just a toilet cleaner for some team. It's like, you idiot. Like, like, you, you wouldn't even be allowed in their team. Like, everyone everyone who starts in those brood war teams literally does tasks like clean the toilet, make everyone else's food, clean the... Di- that is just actually, by the way, that's like that's like saying, oh, you got in the Marines, did you? What, do you have to pass all tests and go under what? Yeah, that's what you do, you moron. Like, to say mm-hmm. that, you actually don't understand how hard that is. That th- you'd have to be... Actually, you couldn't be a weak... Put it this way, this is what I'm building into. You couldn't be a weak person and go through that. Like, the idea that later on, he was just mentally weak and he was just collapsing all the matches. Like, I don't know what it is. I don't know the guys. I want to get your take. Like, who is this guy? What was he trying to go for? Again, the other thing people memed on is, oh, it's obvious how he's losing. He just doesn't ever want to go in his cheese. But I got the vibe when I interviewed him and, and saw interviews he did. He was also one of those guys who was almost like chasing perfection. Like he thought there was the perfect scaling macro game that could be every opening or something crazy. Like that. What do you think of this? Am I exaggerating it? 
No, I think I think you're pretty spot on. So I think you know he definitely bought into that like Korean mindset that there you can play perfectly and you can win every match, right? Um, and you might never achieve that, but that is the best thing to strive towards um, to 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 be the best player. Uh, obviously, very different than than my perspective. And I mean, yeah, like I think people. He deserves a lot of respect for the time he spent in Korea and in, in Brood War. Like it's exactly like that. Like if you're a B teamer, if you're trying to join the team, you're spending a good amount of your day doing those types of chores, and then you're practicing with the A team, and you're that practice dummy, and you're doing what they say, and then maybe you get some time to practice on your own. But it's kind of you gotta prove it. And for a Westerner to come in and do that in a Korean team and be the only Westerner doing that is way harder, right? Like for me at Team Liquid OGS, like having a few Western friends to hang out with, talk with, whatever it might be, is a huge difference maker than being the only Westerner there. It's extremely lonely, right? You, The amount of pressure, loneliness, friends, family, everything, you really cannot explain it unless you have done something like that right and it might be you know like you said something compared to the military it might be you know traveling to another country uh being in jail like there's just it, it's it's a very tough thing to do and i think yeah like he deserves a lot of respect for that i think you know obviously he was very dedicated and he had certain viewpoints and you know uh there is like some anger there and frustration um, but I, I think even outside of the game to this day, like you know, he's a really smart guy. I don't remember what field it is, but it's like biochemistry it's technician or yeah, whatever. Sure. He like he he's pretty successful, still driven. You know, uh, a much happier person, I imagine, outside of uh, competing and all that pressure that comes with it. My segue from the Idra topic is obviously, as you say, his number one fucking pet peeve is A, losing to Protoss, and then it's B, if the Protoss does anything approaching a cheese, some mm-hmm. sort of blind move that they didn't scout. Again, just not playing correctly, not not doing like how you should, do the protocols are how you should play. Now, obviously, that played absolutely into your wheelhouse. Like, not only were you a Protoss player, which already, by the way, let's be real, like, Protoss is just never allowed to win a game unless it's a macro game in StarCraft, otherwise it's bullshit, the race is broken... Mm-hmm. The X mechanic is broken. It's always a new one that all the other races come up with. And then on top of that, you already, like you say, was sort of a freestyle player. Like, I got the sense that you didn't actually buy into that Korean bullshit of, like, you know, it's, they almost made it sound like the Bushido code, like it's dishonorable to stab a guy in his back or whatever. It isn't. If you can fucking rush a guy with swap gates, well, of course you would. Why wouldn't you? You win the game, right? So, like, what did you think on that angle? Like, do you did you ever did you ever care about if people thought you were cheesy or you're just winning these games from, like, lock or whatever? Did you, did you embrace it? Yeah, I didn't care. I just wanted to win. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to play a style that was fun. Um, I would try to, you know, macro sometimes, cheese a lot. Like, I just wanted wanted to win and wanted to have fun. That's that's the two bottom lines. And obviously, a lot of the times, especially against Greg, those two things intersected. Um, I I mean, I didn't buy into it. I think like that Protoss, I, to this day, I cannot get rid of the Protoss bias, if there is bias. I still feel like when you look at the great players of every race, you know, Terran, Zerg, Protoss, I think Protoss is very underrepresented for a for reason. Sure. Um, I think you look at those and, you know, you can name tons of great Terran players that have been staples for that race for, yes. you know, years over years. You look at Protoss and you're like, kind of, yeah, maybe this guy, but you don't feel like super solid about it. Um, and I think that just comes with, you know, what Protoss players, you know, had to deal with. And, you know, at times you're you're really hot and you're going to blink stock all in and you're going to win 80% of your games. And then sometimes it's like, no matter what you do, you probably, you know, have a 30% chance to win or lower, uh, even when you're playing pretty well. So, but I realize I'm probably maybe a little bit biased. No, at the of same course. Time, so I'm trying to ground myself there. Well, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up along these lines. So you, it's not you who said it, I'll, I'll say it, right? What I wanted to ask was this. As you say, if you just... Because really, the real, like, the control group is the elite Koreans. They had basically an of infinite number of people trying at all the races to be the absolute best in in Korea on, like, zero ping with all the best practice conditions. So again, what would be the odds that in both StarCraft Brood War and StarCraft 2, there was no one approaching a fucking Bonjois and Protoss? Like, realistically, there was, like, as you say, you can go, like, four or five names 
deep. If you want to talk about who's the best Terran player of all time, for Protoss, it's just the era. It's like this year, this guy was amazing. Or for three months, this guy was, you know, like, there's never anything. But, so what I want to ask was this. I always felt like the part of, of the fan, and especially the guy who plays just on the ladder, misunderstood about Protoss, is, yeah, some of the abilities and some of the units will seem overpowered, but they aren't in the way that a different race is overpowered. Like, like you know, famously, you couldn't at one point in time build too many infestors. Like, there was never a wrong amount to build. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a terrible strategic element there because obviously you're not, you're not controlling the supply. Whereas I always used to say, famously, if you're a bit like High Templar, there's like, if you build too, too many at one point in time, you fucked your build path. If you build too, too few, you're not going to get the start. You know what I mean? Like, the, I always felt like Protoss is the knife edge race, dude. It should be OP when it's working because I'm having to basically make like eight correct decisions or guesses just to fucking beat you, get you in an even fight or be ahead of you at times. And obviously, most famously, it isn't like Terran, you don't just macro them out of the fucking universe. At one point in time, if you make the wrong tech switch, you're fucked. Like the Terran can, he has all these paths. So get, again, I've sort of given you the layup to do the wine in there, but what do you, give me your thoughts on it in this sense. Yeah, I mean, Protoss is definitely um, like gimmicky in some regards, like you said, Knife's Edge in some regards, um, very hard to balance. I think as time has gone on, like I, do, I, I strongly believe the last year or two of StarCraft II Legacy of the Void is someone that has like watched very little is the best version of StarCraft II. And as time went on, it got better and better in an average sense, not like literally every day is better than the okay. previous day or month or whatever. But yeah, like... The design aspect of Protoss, um, the way their mechanics work, the warp in mechanic, like literally everything about it um, is very swingy. Like you're catching your opponent completely off guard and you're just going to roll them over or, you know, you have not prepared and you can only, you know, warp in these four units, but too little, too late. Or you just warped in and they just dropped some stuff in your base and too little, too late. There's like everything across the race is super inconsistent, right? Where even like just talking about basic units when you're warping in zealots usually you're doing it like i just warped in eight zealots right taryn comes to my base drops two medevac fools of units i i have nothing right and if you do the flip side and you have a warp prism and you go into a taryn's base and you're warping in slash dropping units generally they're churning out units and some are coming out a little bit later some a little bit earlier but you have kind of like that middle ground of like some established defense that's going to be there um so you get those huge swings with protoss and i i mean i don't think it's great design i think it could have been done in a better way but you know not my job is what it is i guess do you believe in the concept that they invented in Korean esports? It's a very interesting one because I have to say, when I look at the best ever Brood War players, I almost buy it. It's basically the idea that there's a thing they call Star Sense, which mm-hmm. the simple explanation for a Westerner is it's like Spider Man's Spidey Sense, where he just tingles when there's something around him or whatever. Like, the idea is they they they've played so many bazillion games that like it's not even from like literally knowing a scout. Like, oh, if I see a guy there, it could be you know, like it's not process of elimination. They really believe you can almost like intuitively just vibe in the game like shit there might be someone about to like proxy behind my base now and you and you just figure it out do you, do you believe this is a thing have yeah. you felt that yeah i mean i because because my play style was so loose right so a lot of it was based on those feelings of like oh i feel like i should have an opening here even if it's a little unconventional like i'm not trying to hit a plus two timing but i feel like this will be the right time to move out or i feel like i should be super defensive right now just that slight like angle that's a little bit off on that unit that I saw does it doesn't make sense like you you do get those those feelings in game and they're not always 100% right and they're not always like going to tell you the full picture but yeah you there there is kind of like that 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 star sense where i don't know it's like something in your brain you you don't know necessarily what it is but like something doesn't click right now like i something's off so you know i'm going to change on the fly what i'm doing or what i'm looking at or what i or i'm gonna scout a little bit this way because it just whatever it is it doesn't feel right um hard to explain i guess but yeah definitely definitely at times yeah for sure so as I alluded to, when you joined EG, I had two angles. The other angle was this one, right? Which is people will forget that way back when, this is before they had J. Dong and Stefano and the other huge names they got later on. But at this point in time, this was when a lot of the original crop they had, minus Idra basically, and even then he was already starting to drop off in terms of results. People used to meme them because obviously they had like a whole bunch of players from the very beginning that they were just sort of loyal to, but realistically weren't going to be like beating Koreans and winning MLG. Mm-hmm. Then they had Idra who was supposed to perform, but he had his own issues going 
going on for whatever reason, performance-wise. When you join this team, like as we said earlier, it's not like you've won tons of tournaments yourself this year. The pressure must have been pretty fucking high. Like I noticed in the documentary when they show like you at Orlando and stuff, like the, dude, it looked like that was Alex Garfield's eyes got about ten times wider when you're in the final. Like it must have been a lot of pressure to perform. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I felt more secure because this is when I first started getting more money. <laughs> So when I went to EG, I signed like, you know, the the biggest contract for me of my whole career, course, possibly yeah. the better con biggest contract for StarCraft two at the time. Um, so I felt like financially secure, which was like one of the most important things for me at that time. Um I, I mean I felt pressure to perform in the sense like I was already doing well, right? Um I don't think I thought necessarily much as much from the business perspective of like, oh, you're joining a new team. You know, this new team is paying you a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of hype around this. You, you, you should perform. But I, you know, I think that's good that I didn't feel that because I already, I mean, that, that, that Orlando event too was the first one, uh, first event my dad ever went to. Uh, so he flew down from Canada and came, came to, came to that event. Also the first event in Florida where I, I grew up um, right. that I went to too. So there was a lot of those things um luckily i was in good form i also spent like i think four or five days maybe a week before this event with alex um in new york we had to like fix some visa issues or something like that um so so we so we had been like you know spending spending time hanging out and things like that so i i, I could totally see it um that that pressure and alex wanting me to win quite a, quite a bit as a journalist, I can tell you behind the scenes, and these were all pretty legit as far as I could tell. If I would ever talk to players, I'm not joking. There was a period, it was a bit after this, where as far as I can tell, dude, every Western player who won like a reasonably sizable tournament just got contacted by EG. And they were like, right, how much does it cost? How much does it cost? People would be shocked at some of the names who didn't join, by the way. Some of them were like almost stupidly loyal to European orgs or, you know, the org that they came up in, they thought, I can't leave now. You know, they've just only started winning. So I, I got the perception from first of all people will know by the fact he made alliance separately that basically alex garfield was almost too good at getting sponsors like he'd already maxed out and saturated all the sponsors he could get and they were way better than everyone else's that's why they had all the money so i got the perception that the org was kind of like we'll just keep buying people until we win the trophies like we're like basically if you're an eg like you either have to be worth the money or you better be a fucking amazing stream personality or you better have something remarkable about you like what do you think on this level because if you just stayed in liquid look you've saw some of the players in there they would kind of ride with you through ups and downs and you could have periods where you're not good what do you think about this angle i mean yeah i mean alex alex garfield was uh very 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 good at his job at that time and i think ahead of a lot of the other organizations in many ways um you know signing signing deals signing sponsors that no one else was even close to signing and not at the numbers in which he was i mean they definitely had like that um new york yankees perspective yes of the money and they can do what they want and they're going to be able to buy the best players. And, you know, they don't necessarily need to like go out and find the best talent early on or potential opportunities in the future. They just will go out and we'll get the best. Um, I think with like team liquid, I don't know team liquid. It's like, I could go both ways. I look back at it. Team liquid also um, at that time, I hope Victor doesn't mind. Um, offered me equity so that was their that was their like counter offer to try to okay. get me to stay and you couldn't have known how much that would be worth now at the time of it, course but it, I know. well <laughs> this is the funniest part okay. at that time the team wasn't worth like anything so oh, they were course. trying so it was like hey we'll give you equity on teamliquid.net and right. it was like oh okay, okay maybe because that's that's their real asset at that yeah, yeah. time but yeah um miss opportunity obviously if I could. <laughs> sure go back in time i would take take that off for um but yeah like i mean obviously evil geniuses was extremely successful and like very yankee yankees like um in 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 the esports world at that time when you won this MLG, the Orlando one, to stress, unlike when I sort of downplayed the early ones from Twitter, this had a whole bunch of Koreans in it. I bet GSL champions in it, legendary Koreans, and basically all the Western players were trying to go to these tournaments. In fact, this was all the ones where I, I thought that the format was a bit stupid, where they had that like ridiculously massive lower bracket, so people could just play like adding mm. up bloody nine games in a row and be like, oh, I'm almost in the lower semifinals. You know, like, whereas in this tournament, basically, you went through that like tiny upper bracket. It was a bit like they did a 
WTI like this years ago, where it was also a crazy format like that. Right? This tournament looks to, like it must have been surreal. You already lost one match. It was to the guy who was your former teammate from Liquid Hero. Aside from that, you won every single game. And as you say, there's the whole storyline with the background, who's where it's located. There's a big tournament win for EG. And another thing people want, might not understand about EG, the org was because so many of the sponsors are from America, actually winning an event on American soil is a big deal. Like, I remember famously that my friend was in the Counter-Strike team and he was basically told, look, it doesn't almost even matter if you win the international tournament, just always win the qualifier in North America. So I can always say, you know, we're the best North American team or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there was the, there were considerations like this at play. It must have been surreal to win this tournament in this fashion. Yeah, I mean, and I had uh, like tons of support. I remember like there were uh, streams and pictures and stuff of... Um, people in the crowd with big huck signs. I remember in Canada, you know, like I'm identifying as a Canadian, I'm a dual citizen. So I have the Canadian support as well. And I'm seeing, you know, videos from like bar crafts and stuff where people are just going absolutely nuts um, when I want it as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of hype. I think you're right on the sponsorship perspective, right? Because even in that sense, you're most likely if you're like um, whining and dining some sponsor guy, you're, you're going to take him to the North American event, sure. right? So you, they're going to show up and then they're going to be there in person. And if it's your team, your player with your sponsor there, they're going to be super excited and they're going to feel a little bit of that, you know, that esports magic or traditional sports magic, whatever it is, wherever they're attending. So no, it was, it was, it was super, super hyped. I, I felt like, you know, pretty pretty well prepared um like you said i lost that one match to hero and it was that that was interesting too because that was like it was it was packaged and branded um from the team liquid side like hero was huck's replacement like that is the guy that's supposed to replace huck he's a protoss player he's up and coming he's pretty good um so all in all i mean i you know played pretty well i was i was pumped you know when i won i did like some little gesture to the crowd you know yeah so i like lifted up i you know beat mc but me and mc at that point you know are like really good friends been in ogs for a while so it was it was it was great you know uh one of what also a very 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 fond memory I've heard from a lot of great pros, even the ones that, like I said, went through the meat grinder of going to korea and going to cordes I've heard one of the toughest things is is a pro you somehow, once you get really good, you don't want to ever believe it's going to go away. You don't want to ever believe you're going to slump. Go. So I've heard, for example, like say you're in the scenario, like when you're in round of eight of Code S, a lot of the pros I know have been in a situation comparable. They always say like, you just think, I'll get him next time. And you don't know that like, there might not be a next time. Or in this case, I mean, you dropped out, you're in Code A again, which just, I mean, that has to feel like you're at the bottom of the pile. Like, how do you go through this period again? Was it difficult mentally to deal with the idea you get reset in a way? Yeah, I mean, once... Once I signed with EG, once I hit a certain level of success, so like there's the money aspect, there's the, there's the prestige aspect, there's like you kind of made it. Um, I, I I wasn't doing those long days. Like StarCraft was not the only thing in my mind anymore, right? Um, I started worrying about other things in life. And, you know, I think, I, I, I mean, I think I was a pretty talented player, not necessarily the most talented, um, not the least talented, obviously, but... Um, I do think like that work ethic, that, that edge, that chip on the shoulder, that drive was the, the big component of me being very successful. And as soon as that, you know, diminished and I, you know, yeah, you, you kind of have this internal conversation of, you know, well, I've been going every day, literally every day for the last year. It's fine if I, you know, take a week or two, you know, and chill out and play this other game or you know hang out with friends or whatever and then slowly but surely that turns into like well like every weekend i'll take time off or a day off and then you know it kind of like snowballs until you know you 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 are assuming to some degree that you've reached that level and so therefore you might get a little worse but you're pretty much going to maintain yes. that level but it, it yeah obviously that 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 doesn't exist right because then you have younger hungrier pros that are um grinding the same way you did and at the end of the day hard work is going to beat out talent nine out of ten times so um yeah i you know basically got lazy lost some drive and then started not doing as well 
I actually have a question along those lines of what you just said at the end there, because there's another thing. Because people in the West have also added in all these elements. Like, for example, I always say the difference between the Korean and the Western player is we all have a dream like this of when I'm going to have made it. And that means I get mm-hmm. to X amount of salary and I get X amount of fame and I win a couple of times. And and then the idea is, this is just a Western way of thinking about success. Right now I get a break. Right now I yep. get a sort of chill. Yeah, the Korean people think I'm exaggerating. You can go look up the interviews. Like, I remember an interview with Fantasy, the famous like Brood War Terran. And in the interview, they ask him basically like, so what do you do outside of Starcraft? And he's like, well, nothing. And they're like, no, no, we just mean like, you know, like, do you like to read books or do you do it? And he goes, I'm not exaggerating. I basically just play Starcraft or I watch like VODs of Starcraft or I like talk to people about Starcraft. And basically my life is Starcraft. I'm trying to be the best. And I remember a similar interview with Faker in League of Legends where they asked him something like that. Like, so what do you do for fun? And his, his idea of fun was he was just learning English from like an actual like, you know, academic perspective. Like, that was his idea of fun, dude. It, was, yeah. it wasn't like, you know, I sit in a hammock and fucking chill out or I watch a Netflix. They, that wasn't even in their people's minds. So the question is basically this. People would say from a Western perspective, like, you've got to have this like healthy work-life balance and, you know, it's going to burn you out and stuff. But I have to say, it's as horrible as it sounds, I don't know if you could ever compete with Koreans if you don't put in something comparable to their time. Like if, they're, if you're doing six hours and they do 12 is it even possible do you think if you could go back and design like the ultimate efficient chair is it possible to get close six to 12 no i think i like yeah like there i think there is like some legitimacy to you can make your time more efficient um by you know practicing less doing more review taking some breaks but it is very hard right at the end of the day i think the problem is is if you don't if you don't love the game, like absolutely love the game, the love the game, love competing, all of it, then you are not going to make it. If you are, especially when you're starting out, if you're starting out and you're already getting like that sense of like, well, I'll put in my time, um, I'll put in my six hours today and get my practice in, you're not going to make it. You're not going to be successful. You literally have to have like that passion, that obsession, that like, I don't care about anything else. This is the number one objective in my head and there is nothing else. And if you don't have that, it's it's hard, right? Because if you have that, you're literally going to do and work as hard as a Korean would in sure. StarCraft or anything else. And if you don't have that, you almost need, it's like you would need someone you would have to have that mindset and then you would need a coach or some manager or someone you respect to come to you and say like, listen, I know you want to play, but take a couple hours off go to the movies with the team, right? And if you have that, I think it is healthier and you can still get more out of 10 hours versus 12 hours, you know, every few days or, you know, do more review or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, like if you're if you're getting, you you read a bunch of books, you kind of like StarCraft and you like, oh, I'm, I'm going to practice four hours a day. I'm going to do two hours reviews, but it's going to be more efficient because I'm going to learn more. You're never going to beat out the pro that is super obsessed loves the game is going to do whatever it takes right um and i i think across life in most instances that 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 rings true as well um traditional sports being a comedian actor i don't know literally anything i think hard work beats out talent uh nine out of ten times Right, the next year, even though you're still having the GSL struggles, you had these two runs at the MLGs where basically you were like basically almost like I think you might even be the best placing Westerner. Like mm-hmm. everyone else in them was just like Marine King and all the best Korean players. Lee basically. Nock or whoever, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the the people who win the GSL or could make the finals, basically. Right, this little spurt again. What, what? How do you describe this? Were you in form again? I remember in interviews you were almost making it sound like you were surprised at the results yourself. Yeah, no, I after. MLG Orlando, um, that run, I would even say like DreamHack Home Story Cup, there was like a clear, like basically when I went over to Evil Geniuses, because I had already a certain level of prestige, once I started making good money as well, like stable money, um, there was like a clear diminish um, in that regard. And then I think it just like picked up, you know, the same way the up came and the trajectory was there, it was, you know, equally going down. So I think even that next year when I still was placing pretty good, um, there, there, you know, I wasn't taking the game as seriously. Like, got girlfriend. Um, also, horrible idea for pros and the girlfriend. Pros are probably the worst people you can date on earth. Oh, um, in, in esports gaming, it's just like they literally should be practicing all day, every day, thinking nothing about the game. And it's, 
you know, I, it happens. I mean, it happens to this day. And I think there are some pros that can balance it, but it's an extremely difficult thing sure. to do. And I feel bad for, you know, both sides, especially, um, you know, the partners of, of those people. So, uh, yeah, like I, I was still riding the wave of that previous work. Right. Um, but I was definitely, you know, losing momentum compared to other people who were, you know, doing more, practicing harder, et cetera. How would you say, obviously, after this period of time, like there were, there was, it would be the odd result every now and then that like you yep. could find something in, like a little bit of a silver lining, but there was a lot of obviously like bad performances, right? If I said before you had haters, people kind of knew anyone in EG, especially after around the time you joined, everyone's getting paid. Like these are all the guys on the big boy salaries. And as I alluded to earlier about the difference between orgs, the difference in between what an EG salary could be and even like a top European one could sometimes, but they could, you could have like two or three times what they're making. And some of those players knew that because, like I said, they'd heard the offers. They'd heard you know, some of the guy I think's worse than me. He's had an offer to join Egypt. So the perception was like I got the feeling a lot of people were trying to hate on you that they were, and it kind of in line with what you're saying. Like you've let your foot off the gas pedal. Like why aren't you? Why aren't you going as hard? Why, this is when you're supposed to be like the Western hero, the the champion. How did you deal with this period? Like, like do you actually look back with any regret? Yeah, of course. I think um, regret's like a natural thing. Um, I think from a health perspective, it was completely reasonable to do less, right? You feel regrets because you feel like I had the talent and potential to do more. Like, unless you literally accomplish everything, right? Like you won a GSL, um, you've won most major events, you're always going to feel like I could have done more, right? I still was a really good player. I still accomplished a lot, you know, one of the most popular players. But yeah, at the end of the day, you still regret things. I think, though, from the perspective of like my happiness, my health, uh, mental, physical, emotional, everything, it, it, it's just tough, right? And that's why when we go back to like that respect for Idra and everything he did, like I cannot put into words um, how how difficult that that path is as as a pro, how lonely it is, um, the mental fortitude you need. And that's why passion and obsession is so important. Because if you're forcing yourself to do that, if you're like, well, I want this, so I'm going to put in the time and I'm going to force myself. You also know that as a pro. When you're going through the motions, I think any pro in any game, and you're just showing up, you don't have like that drive. You're not thinking about the game. And that happens in Pretty much every esport, I would say, most pro players, you 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 get to a point where you don't have the drive, and then you're playing the game and you're telling yourself, "I need to do this because I'm a pro and I want to be good," but you're doing it because you want to be competitive. You're not doing it because you love the game and you're not obsessed anymore. And once you start just going through the motions and just putting in, clocking in, clocking out, you, you're you're going to diminish, right? You're not going to be the same hungriness. You're not going to be the same person. You're not going to be the same competitor everything's going to start falling apart and then it's even harder right because then it's a job you're showing up you hate it you're not getting the results you wanted you're frustrated you're losing and you still got to keep showing up keep showing up and keep getting you know beat down at least in the early stages if you're obsessed you go to korea you practice really hard you're losing it's tough but you're still you still have that drive. You still have that motivation. So you're still achieving and growing and thinking about the game and improving. And you have, you know, like you said, those those psychological uh, breakthroughs in Korea. They call it like leveling up, where it's like you you something clicks right. and you're like, oh, I figured that out. Okay, I know what I have to do. But when you're going through the motions on that tail end, later start of later part of your career, you're just I don't know. It's it's very tough mentally, emotionally, everything. It's it 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 sucks, right? Because you're also usually you already peaked, so you hit yes. that level of prestige, and then you're going down, and you're trying, but it's 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 super tough. I I think pros that um, retire earlier on, not necessarily at the peak, but earlier on that down cycle, probably have um, a, a better perspective than what I did. And I think most pros kind of ride that wave going down. Yes. I mean, it's probably similar in traditional sports and you know other things as well um but it, it's 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 tough in a lot of ways in a lot but it is where i've heard and this actually does match up with a lot of the stories from professional sports basically unless you still were at a level where it was possible to be like a champion again those people who quit do actually tend to regret it in fact oftentimes they try like failed comebacks because they yeah, think yeah. like fuck you know i should have done one more year but i've heard like as you said if you know you're sort of on the way down on the other side of the bell curve actually it's the guys who quit fairly early on and were like actually i don't miss it at all like i don't regret it like it was the right move i've heard basically the ones who actually sort of sometimes 
look back on pro gamer with a bit of disdain as the people they go, go for too long. So what I want to ask is this: Does that imply that on some fundamental level, did you love StarCraft too? Because you still stuck it up for a few years, like, and it's not like you was you were still going to all the tournaments they wanted you to go to. Like, mm. it must be hard to keep going through that. Like, on some level, do you did you love StarCraft too? I think I loved competing. Um, I think I loved competing, and I liked you know um, going to the events. Like at this point, I think it's more of like. I don't want to say like, like maybe not even recreational. It's just like I like competing. I like going to the events. I like the lifestyle. I don't know what else I'm gonna do. You know, I don't have an education or whatever. So I'm gonna keep doing this because it's pretty good. It's not the same as before, and there are tough times and there's a lot of frustration. Um, but I don't think I love StarCraft two at that point. No, I think I love competing and I love everything else that comes with it, but I, I definitely don't love the game, right? I'm not going to bed thinking about the game. I'm not waking up the next morning early soup, you know, like I can't wait to get out of the bed, get to the PC and practice. I'm definitely like going through the motions and like, man, I got to practice. Okay. You know, let's do this. Okay. I did my eight hours today. That's good enough, et cetera. I actually thought even in some of these like some of these years we're talking about, it was actually more noticeable. Like you actually weren't as sort of like lighthearted in the interviews. I mean, famously, right, when me and you had a little bit of a back and forth, if I take myself out of it now, like I just look at what where your career was at at the time and the fr- and the frustrations and p- expectations people had on you. As I said, there was actually a decent contingent of people also were hating on you and basically mm-hmm. wanted I mean, not even just Western players, they wanted EG players to fail because they knew you're making the big paycheck. It's yep. the same in sports, by the way. If someone knows like a like an obvious example would be like Jared Goff or something. People were hating on this guy like a motherfucker because they knew he had the big contract. So they wanted him to fail. They wanted him to not be good enough. He has to get kicked from the team. So, like, do you, do you think it actually got to you? I mean, yeah, like, I, in every aspect, right, um, your life is, is, is suckier, right? There's still, like, you know, up periods, but every time you go to an event, every time you fail, every time you don't, you know, do well in a qualifier, whatever it is, um, the emotional and mental toll. Because it's not like, it's like if you're a tennis player, right? And you retire and you stop competing and you're you're not going for the top spot anymore and you're doing exhibition matches, right? You still like the game and you're playing for fun and, you know, that's one thing. But this, you're still showing up to the, the event. You're still expected to compete. You're still expected to perform. There aren't exhibition matches. And you're still, you know, have you're still putting in eight hours a day, like traditional sports. I think it's a little bit easier because you have those controls. So you have like coaches that are like, listen, we're going to, we're going to warm up for an hour. We're going to go really hard for 30, 45 minutes with some breaks in between. Then we're going to do a cool down period. Then you guys are going to have an hour to a review, but all in all at a pro level, you know, it might be like a four or five, six hour day. And then if you want to go more, you can go to the gym. We'll, we'll have you talk to this person to put something, you know, together. That's ideal. And if you want to look at tape when you get home, you can, and maybe, you know, really hardworking players are putting in a lot of time, but I don't think it's the same as, and I'm not taking anything away from traditional sports because, you know, those guys are beasts and what they go through is a different kind of pain and a different kind of battle. Um, but I think like a time by time perspective, esports versus, you know, traditional sports, I think you're putting in way more time in esports. Um, and and I think it shows, right? You don't, you're not going to have older pros. You're not going to have a lot of older pros that are successful True. and have healthy relationships, have kids, have, you know, whatever, t- like Tom Brady existing in in esports at that age, competing at that highest level for so long, I don't think is going to happen in no, esports. No. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's a lot, right? Um, you don't have exhibition matches. You're you're showing up. You're still putting in eight hours a day at least. If you're at a decent level, like I was at a decent level, you're still practicing pretty hard. Uh, obviously, that you know changes person to person, everything else, but it still sucks. You're putting in that much time, and for what? To go to an event, fail, get flamed, whatever. It, 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 yeah, I mean, that's tough. Understandably, right, on the business side, Alex Garfield actually had a reputation as, like, quite a ruthless character. You know, as a guy who made a lot of, like, very bold moves, sometimes was, like, confrontational or abrasive with other elements of the esports industry. Does the fact that he kept you on this team and that you stayed in EG for this many years... Now, listen, I'm sure at one point in time you took a pay cut. I think you maybe even said that in an interview. But, yeah, yeah. Like, does it, was this loyalty? Is that what it was? Do you think you were providing the uh, the value to the org? What was the perception? I think so. I don't think I have all the answers, and I think there are a lot of things behind the curtain that I can't get into. 
um, that that you know I think to some degree it's loyalty on both sides. So there was there was a year where I was going to go back to Team Liquid, and I think this was a year or two before he sold EG and all the teams to Twitch. Right. And there was definitely this perspective of um, when people join EG, their trajectory goes down. They start doing worse, right? And EG can only buy players and everything else. Yeah, yeah. And I think he was worried. I think more on a personal level, and I think he was a little bit biased and soft towards me. But if I went back to Team Liquid and was successful, so I join EG, get worse. I join Team Liquid, I get better. It kind of hurts, you know, that that perspective, that I can brand. See that. Okay. So there was there was a time where. Um, I had that offer and it was more or less the same money, but I wanted to go back to Team Liquid because, you know, I knew all those OGS guys and, you know, was closer with TL guys anyways. And I still stayed with EG. And then I think afterwards, you know, um, with Twitch owning the teams and everything that comes with it, um, they, I don't think, could pick up new players, but they also didn't want to just drop all the players or teams. So they're kind of like forced in this weird situation until they divested where they're like kind of maintaining everyone, but not really doing much with them um so there was that too so i think it's like a big mixed bag of a lot of things um to be honest so yeah I, with this story you told earlier about like literally i mean even just the first part dude where box is like hey i'd love to like have you be like my practice partner for a couple of days that's already like so like wet dream shit if you're from brood sure. war right sure. so that that one's pretty good but i also also thought again if you have someone who played brood war i don't care what he did in starcraft 2 it must be a- absurd to like, the idea that someone tells you one day like yeah jay dong's your teammate now and mm-hmm. like we're gonna go to tournaments and because people don't know like in brood war jay dong was like a sort of michael jordan type figure you know like it doesn't matter what anyone else says about the other players like that's one of those players that like they have almost like a it almost really is like they fucking they almost glow a little bit more in real life right what do you think yeah no jadong jadong was great i mean um the it, it's weird where you meet someone that's that popular and just is super grounded super nice super chill um pretty extroverted outgoing um you know, wanted to experience a lot of things in Western culture. Like he'd be the guy who would want to like, Hey, after this, like, let's go hang out at a bar or, you know, do whatever. Um, just a great guy. Right. And obviously like a legend, it's, it's weird to think. Yeah. Like looking back, like that uh, Ret- Nada was on OGS boxer, uh, Jay dog, like all those guys just being absolute legends. Um, you got coached succeeding. by coach park, one of the greatest yeah. coaches of all time. Yeah. Everything. I mean, Coma was on OGS, who is now like obviously a yes. great League of Legends coach. Like there is like so many, you know, weird paths and weird things that you look back on and you know, looking up to them while playing Brood War and being like a total scrub, you know, not being really good at all, and then meeting them someday, playing alongside them. Uh I mean, all of it. Weird, right? Weird for me to look back and think about and like ground yourself around those things because it just uh very, very, very different to what you expect life to turn out to be. Right. You know how in the NBA, basically almost every American sport, everyone always talks in interviews like it was the movie of their life, but they're living it as the main character. Like they all talk like, even if they're on the worst fucking NFL team, dude, they're like, we're coming for the championship this year. Like it's win or nothing else, you know, like I'm pr- I'm mm-hmm. giving my heart. And so they all have that whole like thing of like, I'm a warrior. Like I go out and I put it all out for the team. Even if by the way, they're the worst fucking player and you look and they definitely don't practice. So everyone builds up like the hype in their mind of what they're doing, right? And they all sort of have noticed. It's like they copy what the actual, like what Michael Jordan would say or what like the greatest player would yeah. say. And they almost think like, if I say that, like by some like, you know, transitive power, I'll become like that guy. It's like, they think, I mean, right in a sense, the mindset is obviously like part of the key. But I've always thought the weird thing is this. I don't think Westerner fans understand. It's not a joke when those Koreans say what sounds like the same thing in interviews. And even the guy who you never saw win a tournament is talking like, you know, I'm like, I'll practice a million hours. Like I have to get better. The best one is obviously when they apologize for losing the game, right? Mm. From knowing people like Jadong, I think people wouldn't understand this. To me, I would think as a naive Western, well, Jay Dong's a legend in Brood War. He won everything, you know. In StarCraft 2, he's still very good, you know. But like, oh, whatever. If you win something, you win. Dude, I've heard, no joke, players like that, even at the end, they still have that ridiculous Korean like mentality where it's almost like I have a duty to be the best. And they are bombed out as fuck, even if they come second, if they, you know, if they practice and they just have an all kit. I've heard that they just never lose. I heard that like champion ones never lose that mentality. Is it true? I think it's a mixed bag. I definitely have met pros, uh, and I don't want to name names. I don't want to separate the box. But I have met pros who uh, obviously are 
less bummed out. And I think like you can tell, right? It, there are pros that they lose. And that's like for me, when I lost, I would disappear from events. Like I would never go back to the event, right? And it even could be like a home street cup, which is super fun, super chill. Sure. I would notoriously, I lost, you will not see me for the next four days. <laughs> okay. I will literally st- stay in my room. I will not eat food. I will only drink water. Because I don't ever want to step out or see that venue, that place, whatever it is, ever again. And it's super unhealthy, uh, super difficult to take losses. And there are pros who, yeah, like even when they've been playing for 10 years, Brood War, StarCraft 2, whatever, they still have that mentality and they still take losses that hard and they still are going to do whatever it takes to be the best. And then there are pros who uh, definitely have like more of that softer mindset of like they lost, but it's okay. You know, they tried really hard. I think overall on the average, obviously Koreans work harder than Westerners. Um, but there is like a mixed bag, I would say of Koreans that have that diehard mentality and then Koreans that are a little softer in that regard. I mean, I'll give you an example because there's a guy you know very well, MC. When he was briefly, in, they had a partnership with SK Gaming where he was like technically an SK player when I was working yeah. there, right? When I spent time around this guy, he was one of the few people who was the opposite dude. Like, I've seen him lose some, like, what to you would be like a big Western tournament. And he would his, he would literally just say something like, Terran bullshit, and then we would just eat Korean barbecue. He, he actually looked like he didn't give a fuck, dude. And he, was, he was either an amazing actor or for real. He just had like a, he was like, he had the rock and roll mentality, I think. Yeah, he that was kind of like him as a person, personality wise. I think he still took it tough. There are times like there's a notorious picture of uh, he loses to Jinro in a GSL and they agree to like hug or shake hands after the match, no matter who won. Okay. And then Jinro comes into the, the booth and he's like touching him on the shoulder and like MC just will not acknowledge him. Like he's just like face down, like so mad and upset at himself. So, I mean, I think MC like many other people at the later stages of his career got a little bit more easy going. Um, and I think he embraced that, like you said, that personality, that rock star, rock star personality, especially in the West. He was like the go-to, you know, when so many Koreans were being uh, coined as like faceless sure. Koreans, no personality, you know, whatever he was, you know, he loved wrestling and he would do everything that comes with it, um, which I think was very natural for him. Um, and that was the type of person he was. Right. I have a question. I have to phrase this one very carefully, right? Because one thing I don't like is when people just like go too far with this exact topic, right? There is, if you look, a general trend. Like I described it earlier, if you just go from the tactical and strategic side, Koreans typically like the idea of a playbook and an established meta. And even if you're a crazy player, you're some, to some degree within that meta or you're actually directly responding to that meta. And so it still makes sense. It's still like a coherent approach. And the notion I think is like, it has to, what you're doing to some degree has to make sense to your core and your practice partners you can't just really be a guy who's almost like i'm a wild crazy artist i do whatever i want every Mm. game Mm. right but i do think it's made fans think that like like koreans aren't robots guys they actually like if you get to know them like a lot of them actually can be like you like we say about mc they could they could if they'd have grown up in america i'm just thinking about second generation people they would just be like you it wouldn't be that crazy but i will say I have noticed a trend, which is they try to make it like they're the faceless robots who can only follow the programming. But the Westerner is this magical artist who's, you know, he's weaving left and right and he's doing moves. And they try to make it too, a little bit too romantic. But there is a division where I've noticed a lot of the Western players will be much more freeform. You obviously were in your career. Do you actually find, how does that match up against Koreans overall? Because on the one hand, you had your successes, you had your hard time. There's, to some degree, it, it is an element, right, that's a little bit more prevalent in the West. What would you say? Um, I, I, I'm always going to say like the mix of both is the best. Um, I think for me, I mean, it's like a question of like your style and this is like a little artistic, but your style, can you actually like match slash compete slash perfect the style that they're doing more of, right? And they have the infrastructure too, the coaches, the managers, practice partners, all of those things, doing replay review together, having conversations. I think in the West, especially in StarCraft 2 back in the day, you just don't have that infrastructure, right? Like most people are just playing ranked. Maybe they have a person or two they talk to. They're not really, they don't ever have a coach or a manager. You're just freestyling it. Um, I, I think you should have both. I think, you know, my style was very advantageous for me at certain times. It's like, it's almost the same thing for protests as a whole, right? You're, it's not gimmicky, but I would say there are people that I beat who maybe were better players in macro games, um, 
and I beat them because there was like that star sense or me being intuitive or me being cheesy or whatever. And then in the same regard, I feel like I've lost to people that I shouldn't have lost to because of those same aspects. Um, so you're just getting like a wider range of wins and losses and then just inconsistency in general. Um, so it is, I mean, it is what it is. I think if I'm going back and you literally, you know, swapping places with my former self, I think you you want to start on the macro end, right? You want to start in that uh, methodical approach, uh, establishing a base, and then you're adding tools to that with cheeses, timings, whatever else. And I think, you know, as StarCraft II progressed, that's kind of, you know, how the game developed as well uh, once you got to, like, Legacy of the Void and later for a lot of the pros these days. Right, as I alluded to earlier, there was this period when AG existed and then they made Alliance. And initially, like, they sort of, look, for legal reasons, they went, no, no, Alliance is run by this other guy or whatever. It's mm-hmm. like, whatever. Like, look, that's that's a by-the-by side tangent. We don't need to go into this interview. But essentially, mm-hmm. fans could just treat it hypothetically as if, like I said, Alex Garfield was like, I've got too many sponsors. I've, I've almost got, like, t- enough I could go with my right. Wait a minute, why don't I just make a rival team and just have two sets of it, right? So he had mm-hmm. a European one. And obviously, even the timing was perfect. He got that amazing door. Water Squad, which went on to win TI. He had Nanawa over there. Now, I wanted to get your take on this, right? Nanawa, listen, I'll be fully biased. Like, I was friends with Nanawa. We're both assholes in a way that uniquely bonded us in a way. You know? And we were very anti-social people back then. Let's be real. I've come a long way since then. He's done a little bit. He's, he's not as bad, but even so, still a ridiculous human being if people see my interview with him. He had some mad conspiracy theories back in the day. Like, way worse than the... Like, I actually think there probably is something to those Koreans doing that if you just know how... Even just they were sort of as a team when they're not on the same team but they think it's more important the Korean wins so along these lines right he, his whole theory was he was supposed to join EG but then he tried this is where his version he thinks basically that you did him dirty because whereas Idra let you join EG and didn't push back whether that was even an option or not you know it's this is all within his mind at this point he thinks that when he came to join EG and that Alex Scarfi was super horny to sign him that you were sort of like I don't want to play in the same team and he was like ah but I'll put him in the European team instead <laughs> is there anything to that is this completely fiction what do you think i honestly i don't think so i don't remember completely like i think it's totally possible that at some point alex garfield asked me and says like hey do you like nanawa and i'm like no not really um i don't think i would block him but i i i honestly don't remember i will say that me me and nanawa was like a weird thing because there was this period of time where we were like pretty close friends. And then I think it's kind of true, especially for uh, people that are a little bit um, less mature and just don't have the right perspective that the, the best of friends make the worst of enemies because right. there was like, I don't, I think like our initial beef was he got invited to like a code S or something and I didn't get invited and I thought I deserved it. And I said something semi, um, I, I don't want to say it wasn't banter like, oh, I wish I could get a code S or, you know, like a tweet or something like okay. not super combative, not at him, but like quote tweeting or, you know, whatever the kids yeah, call yeah. it these days. Subtweeting. Yeah, yeah subtweeting. Yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah, we just we like that blossomed and kept growing into like a real rivalry and we just didn't like each other. Um, and I think I was a lot more confrontational than him at this point. So I was definitely okay. pushing that. But I don't know if I would ever, or, or or if I did block him from joining EG. I don't. I don't know. I think it's possible. I don't think it's likely, but I honestly don't remember. Was any of it actually in game stuff? Because obviously you played a whole bunch of times. You both Protoss players. By the way, I'll say this is the hilarious thing I've always thought about Protoss. And I love Protoss in all the games. Sure. Is Protoss players hate each other because obviously PvP is always <laughs> the most bullshit matchup, isn't it? Like it's like the idea is everyone everyone has the chaos in that matchup. So I will say it. the reason I want to ask about this particular relationship is because when I saw what an amazing job you did, sort of being the fucking Idra whisperer, mate, where he kind of came on side eventually. Why could this never happen with Anawa? um yeah i mean i don't I, I it was totally personal it was not in game at all so it's like the reverse of idra's like a you know easy to get along without a game an asshole right. in game for me and him it was like completely personal in game not as much beef i think like we played a few times when we didn't get along and neither of us like pushed the envelope like i win and i'm like yeah pussy take that or whatever and he wins and he talks trash to me it was never you know i think we still had some level of like mutual respect there was just a lot of 
personal beef because we were friends and then all of a sudden you know not getting along and having different perspectives of i don't know i think you know at the end of the day a lot of ego um i think i mean like today i have no issue with him or anything like that um you know wish him the best and all that but you know when you're young you're a pro you're not very mature there's a lot of ego you're both pro toss players there is kind of like a little bit of that like rivalry of like who's the best western pro toss at that time right and i think that all kind of mixed together with you know already being friends and then enemies and you know turns into that that beef when you were actually in this era when you were fully a pro all the all the all the drama, all the fame, and all the stuff. Like, how did you actually handle? Because this is going on in the background. The fact that like StarCraft Two was never a dead game. Like, obviously, it still has viewership now. The fact that a, a lot of fans won't understand if they're from outside of StarCraft as a game, or maybe they were only in the StarCraft bubble, is it's not that StarCraft Two died and became tiny. It's that unfortunately, the other esports like League of Legends just sort of supernovaed and just made it look tiny in comparison. It actually, was still a sizable game. Like compared to games like Mass CS:GO, it took a while for soft it took years before CSGO got big in StarCraft mm, mm. but the perception from outside was this was the number one game it was the one you wanted to be famous it had all the money in and then the idea was it was going down over these years so how did you handle that aspect like the the idea you know like at some point you're thinking the game will die or it's going to be diminishing returns right yeah uh, I mean it doesn't help right I think you as a pro are weighing that and you know looking at your career looking at the effort you're putting in the sacrifices you have to make you know definitely one of those things that is impacting uh the level of passion and drive it's very easy i think to be very driven if you're the number one player in the number one game i think it's a very different approach whether pros want to admit it or not when you're you know on the lower end of that uh, that ladder um and then like considering pros and you know if i put all this effort in for the next two years i could be you know this good and then realizing like that might not be um what you want depending on the trajectory of the game um so yeah i mean it it it, it was a big impactor i think for everyone all the pros at that time seeing that feeling that uh knowing that um and just kind of seeing you know uh, other games take off and do a lot better especially after being number one right you're coming once again from being like the game into you know less and less and less so this video was kindly supported by lagger 15 matt pugnacio racula scaparin travis goff zach smid adam oaks alexander rao animosity but pounder 420 chris Hades, J Dobbs, Jensen Go, John Shelton, Joseph Ginsberg, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Zumba, Zyrathenia, and as always, a special thanks goes out to both Jerky's Minion and DZL. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Would you like to ask a question for my monthly AMA? Want teasers? for upcoming content or interview guests have I done, etc. Do you want to take part in one of those donated discussions? Well, if you want any of the above and previously mentioned, put your money where your mouth is and join the Squirrel Malati today at the description box link to Patreon.